Okay, it's, it's uh, 10 a.m. according to my computer's clock. So I'll go ahead and just start with some, some stuff. I'll, I'll still wait a minute or two to actually delve into the content. But first, I want to say thanks, everyone, for being here. Sorry about the time confusion yesterday, but the remaining four lectures are going to be starting at 10 a.m. Central Time. So um, let's see. If you're not already part of the Topological Field Theory Slack channel, I encourage you to go take a look because that's where I'm posting stuff like um, links to slides, links to, I've written a couple, a couple exercises for yesterday's and today's talks, and I'll continue doing that for the remaining three talks. These, the, again, these are more things just to think about rather than, you know, problems that are necessary for getting a grip on the material, but they're, you know, I think th they're things that helped me understand stuff. So I hope, I hope they're the same for you. And also that's where I'll be, you know, that's where we'll be posting recordings. So um, yesterday's recording is up. Today's recording will be up later today and so on. Although if in retrospect, if you are here able to see this, then probably you don't need the recording, but still, you know, it might be useful information. Okay. So today we're going to talk about invertible field theories. And this, so this is a concept due to Dan Fried and Greg Moore, and subsequently has, um, it shows up a bunch in physics applications. Maybe I'll say a little bit about that in a sec. But the, the idea, oh, yeah, before I get into that, I wanted to re uh, remind everyone that there's, um, you know, just like, just like there uh, yesterday, there's going to be office hours, just sort of informally, I'll be, I'll be around to chat, you know, talk about questions, talk about things related to TFT that may not be covered by the course, just come by and say hi. It'll be this afternoon again at, um, I think it's 3 p.m. Let me double check to make sure because I did just say that uh, to a bunch of people, but I'm pretty sure it's 3 p.m. Um, and yeah, so I, I hope to see you there. Oh, one moment. Yes, 3 p.m. So I'll be there around, you know, it'll be three to maybe four ish whenever, you know, based on if people are around and chatting. Okay, back to invertible field theories. We are, um, so today it's, the, the study of invertible field theories, these are the simplest possible examples of topological field theories that are not themselves non-trivial. And so I wanted to start here with, you know, with this, uh, these examples. The classification is, the, the way that people usually classify them is, you know, brings in tools of homotopy theory, which is part of the reason I like it, but you are not me. And so you may or may not like that. So I tried to extract a an, you know a proof argument that that doesn't delve into those details and then i'll say what's going on really at the end but um and so so yeah i, I hope you like this and i hope you like these examples so what we're going to do is first first i'm going to say what these things actually are you know this, this is slightly important and then probably between one and two i'll say a few words about what where these appear in physics um then there's the um the bulk of today's lecture is going to be classifying these things using a tool called Picard groupoids. So um, basically, it turns out the classification of invertible field theories, or invertible topological field theories, sorry, involves, like, you, you can reduce it to some category theoretic questions about Picard groupoids, which are, which sounds scarier than it is. And then there was a folklore result that, that turn this into algebraic questions. And then we can, you know, we know what the answers are to those algebraic questions. So we know the classification of convertible field theories. This is a um, theorem due to Fried Hopkins and Telemann. And then there's important related work of Fried Hopkins. So after that, I'll be able to say some examples. And finally, I'll talk about the um, homotopy theory that, that's really going on under the hood. And so if you care about extended invertible field theories, or if you care about, um, well, algebraic topology or homotopy theory, this might be, you know, there, there might be something interesting in there for you. So first, so I'm going to talk about invertib invertibility in a kind of abstract way and then say it more concretely. So throughout, we're going to have this analogy that like symmetrical nodal categories are there's this fancier version, this categorified version of something of, you know, commutative rings. So if you have a commutative ring A, there's a notion of a unit, which is invertible under multiplication. There, so it's a condition. There exists x inverse such that x tensor x or x times x inverse is, is the identity. So we want to make the same definition as symmetrical nodal category. But now multiplication is the tensor product. X is an object rather than an element, and one is the unit object. 
so first there's the bad news, which is that, you know, once when you, when you categorify conditions become data. So X inverse is a choice and the isomorphism is a choice. And so that, 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 that's kind of sad, but the good news is that just like when choosing duality data, it's not really a choice. The, uh, there's a groupoid of invertibility data and it is, uh, it is the tri uh, equivalent to the trivial groupoid. So it's sort of like picking a Ramanian metric on a field. Like, yeah, you have, to, you have to do it and different ones have, have important, like depending on how you're doing it, there might be important uh, differences, but the homotopy theory of choosing Ramanian metrics is, is, is there's a contractible space so somehow, as far as homotopy theorists are concerned, a manifold and a manifold with some Ramanian metric are equivalent. And similarly here, an, op, you know, an invertible object, or sorry, an object which emits an inverse, and an object with a choice of inverse are basically the same thing. So in complex vector spaces with the tensor product, a vector space is invertible if and only if it's one dimension. So if it's one dimensional, but right, because the you know, what does tensor product do to dimensions? It's multiplicative. So the only option, is, the, the only hope is if you're one dimensional. And if you're one dimensional, the dual is a, um, is a good choice for the inverse. And then co-evaluation is an isomorphism. Or sorry, evaluation is an isomorphism. Um, co-evaluation is two, but evaluation is easier to think about. So you can think of invertible vector spaces as simple examples of vector spaces. You know, in some sense, they're all trivial, right? They're all or they're trivializable. They're all isomorphic to the, tri to the uh, trivial vector space, just the complex numbers. But they're not, but, but like maybe you have to make a choice. And in fact, if you do things like vector bundles or representations, which are sort of families of vector spaces over stuff, then what you get is there are non-trivial invertible objects, you know, one-dimensional representations, line bundles. Uh, before I go on, are there any questions? And in general, if you have questions, feel free to, um, Open, you know, let me know in chat or just unmute and ask me. So, and I'll try and remember to pause for questions during. Okay. So, the um, the key notion for today's for today's talk is the notion of a Picard groupoid. So, a Picard groupoid. First of all, it's a groupoid, which means that all morphisms are invertible. So you have a category and you have a bunch of objects, but every map between two objects is an isomorphism. And moreover, it's a symmetric noidal groupoid. Okay, it's a symmetric noidal category, which is a groupoid. And moreover, all objects are invertible under tensor product. And so this is the thing about Picard groupoids is people will talk about invertible objects and morphisms like in the same sentence very quickly. And they're, I mean, they're two different but related notions. Objects are invertible under tensor product, morphisms are invertible under composition. Okay, so given any symmetric monoidal category C, I should have said C is symmetric monoidal, sorry. We're gonna let C star or C times denote the subcategory of objects which are tensor invertible and morphisms which are composition invertible, like I said. And so this is a Picard group. So vect star is one dimensional vector spaces, also known as lines. And maps, you know, when is a map between two uh, one-dimensional vector spaces invertible? When it's not zero. So, um, so those are the morphisms. So, um, what was I saying? Right. So this should be by analogy with this, with the uh, group of units of a ring, the abelian group of units. And if, so, a, a ring categorized commuter of ring categorized to symmetric modal category, abelian group categorized to Picard group. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this for topological field theories. And this definition is the kind that makes my geometric topology friends kind of, kind of unhappy. So I'm going to say a, a definition that they will like better after this. So symmetric monoidal, so, so topological field theories, recall, a topological field theory is a symmetric monoidal functor from uh, the Bordesian category of vector spaces. And what that really means is that a, an n minus one manifold gives you a vector space, you know, the space of states. And a bordism gives you a linear map, which you might think of as time evolution. And disjoint union goes to tensor product. So disjoint union of state spaces is, or sorry, the, the state space on the disjoint union of two manifolds is the tensor product of the state spaces on those two uh, components. And so, so these are, so all of that is wrapped up in the, in the very concise notion of a symmetric monoidal functor. Anyways, topological field theories form a category 
Um, it, so in general, functors form a category. So objects are functors, morphisms are natural transformations. And we're just going to stick the word symmetric monoidal in front of that. Again, this is doing a lot here. You, you can think about this as like commuting with tensor product, even though like the actual details can be a little bit annoying. And this, this category of topological field theories has a symmetric nodal structure given by a pointwise tensor product. So just like you should, you should think about how if you have a space x and you have functions to the complex numbers, then th that, that, uh, that set of functions has a ring structure. You know, there is the, and multiplication is pointwise multiplication. So the unit is the constant function valued in one, and the multiplication is just evaluate at, you know, evaluate at x. And so we're going to do the same thing with topological field theories, which are sort of like, you know, function, they're sort of like functions from a space board end to, to, to C, but really they're vector spaces. So the tensor product of Z1 and Z2, Z1 and Z2 being topological field theories, you know, you evaluate it on anything, a manifold, a boardism, or whatever. And you just say tensor together. Okay, you have to check that that's a topological field theory, but it is, and everything's good. And the unit is the trivial theory, the constant functor valued in just the unit complex vector space and the identity. So we had a notion of invertible object in a general symmetric monoidal category. An invertible topological field theory is an invertible object in the category, symmetric monoidal category of topological field theories. Um, this is a concise definition. Stay, you know, stay tuned. Next slide for a better one. But before that, are there questions? Uh, I have a question about the previous slide. Yeah. Great. So just to visualize this vect cis uh, cr cross, should we think of this as like a single object with C star endomorphisms or as? Well, you can. Right? So here's a question for you. When you think about the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, is there an, are, is there an object for every, for every natural number? No. Or is it just like all the vector spaces there are and then all the maps between them? Like, I, I, I'm actually asking you. The latter, rather, I think. OK, in that case, you should think about vector star as all possible one-dimensional vector spaces. It is true that there are, it's equivalent to a single vector space with a C star of automorphisms. But you know, when you do things like work over families, that's not good enough, right? Thanks. Yeah, good, good question. Are there more questions? Okay, well, as you have more questions, please do not hesitate to ask me or ask in chat. So, ah, okay, so I said, I said this that, you know, oh no, I didn't say this, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna say what, what okay, invertibility is very abstracting, what is it really? So what does it mean for a, an, a function in the ring of functions to be invertible? What that means, you know, you, you think about its graph, you can define one over F if F is never zero. You know, this, this is a thing we tell our calculus students. And, what we're going to do the same thing here, uh, where you, you, you can define invertibility abstractly in this ring, but you, you have an inverse if for, all, um, if for all objects and morphisms in the Bordism category, Z sends it to something invertible. So again, there's two different things going on. An object is sent to something invertible under tensor product, so a one-dimensional vector space, and a mor morphism, a Bordism, is sent to a composition invertible linear map. So what does that mean? So invertible means for all objects, the state space is one-dimensional, and for all morphisms, all bordisms, the linear map is non-zero. Time evolution is not zero. And so that, that's what an invertible topological field theory is. You can think of these as nearly trivial, but not quite trivial. And in fact, in physics, there were lots of things which were top, invertible topological field theories, which were dismissed as trivial before people realized, wait, there might be something here. So why don't, I, why don't I take this opportunity to say something not in the slides and say a little bit about how these appear in physics. So one example is, well, you can think of these as nearly trivial topological field theories. And so if you expect a thing in physics to be classified by topological field theories, maybe your first example should be the simplest examples. Just like in this course, we're going to first talk about invertible field theories as our, um, as our simplest examples of topological field theories. So if you're a condensed matter theorist studying topological phases of matter, that this is a thing that they do, and it is generally believed, and there, there, there's a lot going on here that like, we haven't made into math yet, and sometimes hasn't been even made into real physics yet, that there should be a way to classify these by taking a low energy approximation and obtaining a topological field theory. And so somehow that means like you have the system which behaves sort of like a quantum mechanical system, and you want to sort of cut off all the, 
all the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian except for the bottom one, and then maybe you obtain something something more topological. So um, th this is you know classifying these things is very complicated. It turns out, and so you might want to st start with a special case. And the special case is what's known as invertible phases, or maybe symmetry protected topological phases, or maybe even short range entangled phases, depending on whom you ask. And so they should be classified at low energy by invertible field, topological field theories. A lot of open problems, both in like the physics and in making the physics into math, which are sort of two separate things. A lot of open problems are related to what I just said. So, you know, big Bourbaki dangerous bent sign here. But you could make progress on like understanding are your ansatz is correct by comparing the, what the physicists have done with mathematical classifications of invertible field theories. And this is what Fried Hopkins do in this paper from 2016. And so that's, that's one application of where invertible field theories appear in physics, although their invertible field theories have a stronger structure. They're unitary. Another application is that sometimes quantum field theories or topological field theories are not quite precisely defined. There's an issue, like there, there's sort of a, a little extra data that you have to do to, to define them. And the famous example is Turn simons theory. And one way to describe this in physics language is to say that, so, so this theory has an anomaly. And there, you know, if you ask four different people what an anomaly actually is, you will get five different answers. But one way, as, you know, as, as exposited in the paper of Free Telemann from nine years ago, is that um, your theory is actually a boundary theory to some bulk theory, which is invertible. There's, okay, I'm simplifying slightly. And I'm not defining any of this, and I'm sorry, but it's, you know, we don't have time to get into all these details. But the idea is that you can, you can understand anomalies, therefore, by understanding invertible field theories. And so there's plenty of cases where, in physics, where people care about anomalies. And maybe classifying invertible field theories is a helpful way to get your hands on what the possible anomalies are. And so, so there's, there's several papers which actually just do this. So Dan Fried and Mike Hopkins have this paper from last year, or maybe even the year before by now, where they do this for something called M-theory. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say about this, but I'd be happy to chat about it later. So, you know, for example, hit me up in Slack or, um, during office hours or even send me an email. So the thing about invertible field theories is we know what all of them are. Like we can just classify them. This is the nicest possible case. There are other classification theorems for other kinds of field, th topological field theories. Um, but this is, this is sort of the simplest, uh, or rather it's the simplest one that works in any dimension. So Fried Hopkins Telemann, they first say this in this paper, consistent orientations of moduli spaces. Shortly after that, there's this, or a couple of years after that, Dan has this paper on, called, uh, I think, short range entanglement in invertible phases. And then after that, uh, Dan and Mike Hopkins have this paper called reflection positivity in invertible topological phases. And so, so that's the one that first says this really, really explicitly, but they add additional assumptions. And so th this is really where, so Fried Hopkins Telemann is where this uh, first really happens. So invertible n-dimensional TFTs of manifolds with a Xi structure. So let me re remind you, n-dimensional means bordisms are n-dimensional. And Xi is saying we're choosing a tangential structure. So maybe we're saying oriented TFTs, or maybe we're just saying unoriented, or maybe we're saying spin, or maybe we're saying invertible TFTs on manifolds with a principal SON bundle, and also a map to like, you know, KZ mod three comma four, like just, just some, some topological structure that we've encoded, like we discussed last time. So these things are an abelian group under tensor product, right? Because if you tensor invertible, tensor invertible, you will get an invertible field theory, just like an abelian group of units. Oh, it's an abelian group of isomorphism classes, it turns out, but fine. So the, the, this abelian group is isomorphic to a group of bordism invariants. And let me say a couple of things. First of all, we're valued in not vector spaces, but a, a slight fancying of that called super vector spaces. So this is where. So super vector spaces is a symmetric monoid category of complex vector spaces with a Z2 grading. So you can, you can say when two elements are even or odd, which has the sign rule that you learned in the, you might've seen in the cohomology. So odd degree elements, A, t a tensor B, if A and B are odd, is equal to minus one B tensor A. So making sense of that as symmetric monoid category is something that is a, you know, it's a good way to get a, gra a good grasp on like, well, what is actually happening in a symmetric model category? What is this data doing? But the, you, know, you can do it and it's a, it is a good category to have around, I think. For example, it'll make the classification easier. Just vector spaces from this perspective is a bit harder. So anyways, 
we, we, we care about super vector spaces. And um, there, are, there are physics reasons for caring about that, which I'm not gonna get into, but we're gonna use this classification or this target. And this group is naturally, naturally in the change of tangential structure, isomorphic to the group of SKK Bordism invariants. So, what, so SKK, I'm not gonna say what that is yet, but it's a modified version of Bordism invariants. That's a little harder to compute. And we're, we're uh, mapping into C star. So the idea is that this is the partition function of, the, of an invertible TFT. So an invertible TFT, the partition function, you can, you can actually check by hand. Uh, as as this, this is an idea of uh, Kreck, Stoltz, and Teichner, that it is this kind of Bordism invariant. And then it turns out that it's classified by its partition function. So I will say what an SKK Bordism invariant is when, we, uh, when, when we're in the middle of the proof, in, at, like at the, when the time is right. The point is, invertible TFTs are given by Bordism invariants, but there's that one little asterisk. Uh, are there any questions before we talk about the proof? All right, well, hopefully there will be questions soon enough. So the proof sketch. I might have already said this, but if not, first we're going to argue that classifying invertible topological field theories is purely a question about the card group weights. And so we, we can lose all semblance of caring about like topology or even physics. And then it turns out that uh, you can express the card group weights and maps between them solely in terms of algebraic data. And this is a notion, this is something called the stable, one-dimensional stable homotopy hypothesis combined with a little bit of Postnikov theory. And then finally, we know this data for the, board, the boardism category, which is um, hard work of Galatius, Mads, and Tillman, Weiss, and then also um, Nguyen. And then for super vector spaces, where you can sort of do it yourself. And then, okay, then we, then we wind through, okay, well, what, what, what does that data tell us? And then we conclude. So first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna review, or, you know, this might be new, but it shouldn't be too complicated, the notion of group completion. So it might be new only because we don't talk about monads that much. But let's say I have a, a homomorphism of commutative monads. And let's say that the image lies in the uh, sub-abelian group of invertible elements of it, right? Because in a monoid, things might not be invertible, but some things, you know, some stuff is. So one thing you can do with a, with a commutative monoid is you can group complete it by formally adjoining inverses. You just say, I have, I have a bunch of new elements. I'm calling them x inverse, y inverse, z inverse. And I'm just declaring that multiplication x times x inverse is one. So you might've seen this called the Grotendieck group or k zero or k. And um, I'm gonna call it m bar just by analogy later. And so the shining example is you start with the natural numbers and you turn the crank and you get the integers. And so formally, you're taking like pairs of natural numbers and saying this is p minus q, and that's that's as 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 an integer. But like you know, as far as set theory is concerned, you're doing you know, that, that there's no difference. And so you could just generalize this to to arbitrary commutative monads. Okay, so now we have an abelian group, m bar. So we can now extend our um, our invertible map to a map of abelian groups. And how is that? Well. We know, so we, we, we have these new objects, X inverse, where X is an M. X inverse is an M bar. And so we don't know what F of that is, but we can just say that we know F of X is invertible. You know, we had that condition on F. And so we can say F of X inverse is F of X inverse. And this, this condition guarantees that, F, that, that the, the extended map, which, I, which I've called F bar, is a group, an abelian group homomorphism. So moreover, this is somehow no additional data. I told you how to get F bar out of F. And if you have F bar, you can just restrict to M and therefore obtain F. So these things determine each other. And in fact, you know, doing, doing a little more, like be, being a little more careful with that bijective correspondence, the abelian group of invertible maps, M to N, meaning the image lies in the, in the uh, group of units, is naturally isomorphic to the abelian group of all maps from M bar to uh, group of units of N. So, so this is the example that we're going to categorify. That um, that if if a map factors through, if if a map has image in the invertible stuff, it factors through the group completion, and we lose no data this way. Are we good, good to go? All right. Now, now we now we categorify. So, given a symmetric monoidal category, 
and a map to a Picard groupoid, so for example, an invertible map to something, then the map factors through the Picard groupoid completion, uh, C bar. And it's the same idea. So what we can do is we can add inverses to objects and to morphisms. So we add inverses to objects under tensor product, morphisms under composition, and we obtain a Picard group. And that's, that's called C bar. So now again, we construct F bar, this functor between Picard groupoids by, um, by, by the same formula. Here I want to say that map really should mean symmetric monoidal function. Sorry about that. But what, what we're going to do is we're going to say we have these new objects X inverse, and we define F bar to be the inverse under tensor product of F. And we have these new morphisms X inverse under composition, and we define F bar to be the inverse under composition. So if you remember, invertibility is data. And so we, maybe we have to choose this data. It's, it's, it's data that makes a contractible choice. But you know, th th there's a little bit of, you, know, you, have to, you have to add a little bit of spice to make this, to make this work, but the spice is not so bad. And, every, and, and you, can, you, know, you can do it and it works. So I just wanted to mention that's a thing that, that you know, it's not automatic, but it's not that bad. And so once again, F determines F bar the same way and F bar determines F by restriction. So, you know, souping this up, or sorry, just, just making that bijective correspondence a little stronger, this means that if we want to classify invertible topological field theories, which are these things, these, these or sorry, maps that factor through uh, the, the Picard group like Vect star, then we just, if that's equivalent to computing the abelian group of um, isomorphism classes of Picard groupoid maps, so symmetric monoidal functors between these two Picard groupoids, from the groupoid completion of the Bordism category. So just to, just to say that all again, we want TFTs, invertible TFTs are maps from the board, symmetric modal functors from the Bordism category to in the invertible subcategory, uh, sorry, the subcategory of invertible vector space. And therefore, they, they, they factor through the Picard group weight completion, and the classification is an isomorphism. So we're going to try and understand these Picard group weight maps. Are there any questions before I go on? Um, so on the previous slide, we started with a map from F to N such that the image of that map landed sort of in the, in the units. And then I guess on, on the next slide, we start by assuming that we're just mapping to a group weight to start off with instead of Ooh, like landing in a, does, does that make sense? Right, so, so these are equivalent, right? Because you, okay. you start with some, you start with D, which is some symmetric monoidal category, and you say the image of F, of F is contained in the uh, Picard group weight of units D, D times. D, right? Okay. Like you could just. Okay, you sound still confused. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Could you just say that again? Yes. So here we started with N, which has non invertible stuff, and we just mm -hmm. said the image of F is contained in the invertible stuff. Yes. But we could also forget about N and just say, ah, F lands in N star. Sure. Great. Okay. Okay. Here, okay. Thanks. Same thing where we could, we could start out with D and say, ah, we landed in the invertible stuff, or we could just throw out D and say, ah, we only have the invertible stuff and we're, and those are the same somehow. Okay, now, great. Thanks. I should have said that more parallel. Thank you for asking. Hey, um, Arun, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I, whenever I see some, something like this, this inverting process, it's like, you know, here be dragons, uh, like does Z need to be small to do this or. Uh, sorry. Yes. Out? Great okay. question. And. So, so I am not good at size issues. And so here is what I will tell you is that mm -hmm. ve um, vector spaces. So thanks to the theorem last time, uh, as the, Im uh, the image of any topological field theory is contained in the subcategory of finite dimensional vector spaces. So mm -hmm. we can make that small. Right, yeah. Um, and then the Bordism category can also be made small by embedding everything, manifolds, Bordisms, whatever, inside R infinity. So once you've done that, you, so now, now that you have your small categories, you can just do whatever you want, localize, invert, whatever, willy-nilly. I mean, you're absolutely right to be careful about this in general. So when you, you're, you're embedding them in R infinity, how does that make it small? So are you, there's this, so you know that by Whitney, you can embed an RN for some n. Right. And by, I think, Wu maybe, Wu Wenjun proved that if you, if you make n even just a little bigger than the up to isotopy, sorry, there's one isotopy class. So therefore, you, you can think of every, like the Bordism category of n manifolds or n manifolds embedded in R infinity. Those are equivalent. 
because the, 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 the embedding is no data up to, up to like, or sorry, it's, it's contractual data, I guess. I, I think I see. So you're saying like, if you give me two diffeomorphic manifolds, then mm -hmm. you can just consider this isotopy class. And that's like collapsing the data. Right? Yeah. Okay. And so, and then, you know, there's a subsets of R infinity are a set, although a mm -hmm. pretty big one. Okay. And then we're set. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, I think this is an important point to mention, which is that inverting stuff, you know, playing inverting subcategories of categories is a subtle issue when it, when your categories are large. And this, you know, some very good homotopy theorists spent a lot of spent a lot of time making sure that you can do this. So, you know, thank you for raising this point. Uh, more more questions. Um, are you just working with Picard groupers as a full subcategory of all symmetric monad categories, and just doing everything here? Or? Um. I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yes. Uh, any any further questions, or maybe maybe if Saad, if you didn't get your question answered. No, that works. Thanks. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, more questions. I do have one other question. I don't know if I'm Wait. going to like beat you to a punchline here. I was kind of worried about asking this, but you can take direct sum and you can take tensors. So like. What do these invertible guys like generate under those two operations? Oh man, that is a great question. So tensor product keeps you within invertible field theories. Direct sum, I mean, direct sum leaves invertible field theories. And the question is what it does in general. So in dimension two, you generate everything. Uh, even I think just with direct sum. Uh, in general, like the open. Cool question. I like that. I certainly know of no theorem that says above dimension two what, what's going on. And I guess I wouldn't expect that if you handed me some arbitrary topological field theory in some high dimension that there's an easy way to write it as a direct sum of invertibles. That's so yeah, no, I, I really like that question. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead, but if you have if you have more questions, you know, ask, you know, put post in chat or interrupt me, you know, so that we don't lose the thread and um, we get your question answered. The uh, the key thing about Picard groupoids is that we can we can deter we can express them solely in terms of algebraic data. There's three things. So first is pi zero, and so the fact that I'm calling these pi zero, pi one, and k, if you if you are familiar with something called Postnikov theory, this is this is suspicious and is not a coincidence. But if you're not, that's no worries. So pi zero is the abelian group of isomorphism classes of objects under tensor product. So this is this is a commutative monoid a priori, but really because we've thrown out anything which is not invertible, this is an abelian group. Moreover, pi one is the automorphisms of the of the unit. So um, you know we we have a symmetric monoidal structure, so we have a unit, and then we just say, okay, well, what are all the maps from it to itself? So a priori, this is just a group, but the uh, Ekman-Hilton argument implies it's an abelian group, and so this is the same thing. As the, as the fact that pi two of a space is abelian or slightly more related, that pi one of a topological group is always abelian. You know, you've got two different uh, multiplications, they satisfy a commutativity relation and then wham, they're actually the same and they're, bo and they're both abelian. So pi zero and pi one are two, two pieces of data. They're, that's not a complete invariant, but we're gonna get one more. Before that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna canonically identify all of the automorphism groups in my groupoid with uh, pi one. So first of all, you can tensor with the identity, tensor a function with the identity. And that brings us from automorphisms of one to automorphisms of one tensor X. And part of the data of a symmetric model category is a canonical map from one tensor X to X. That is, that is an isomorphism. So in other words, we've just provided, we've provided data of an isomorphism from pi one to automorphisms of any object X. And so, um, so this is good because the last invariant, the K invariant needs that specifically. So this is a map from pi zero tensor Z2 to pi one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, given X and pi zero, we're gonna take the class of the symmetry. Map. So the symmetry is a map from, so it is data for every object X. It is a map from X tensor X to X tensor X, which you should think of as the swap map. So in vector spaces, this map is the identity. In super vector spaces, this map is the identity on even elements, you know, which are homogeneous, and it's minus one on odd elements. So um, in general, it can be it can be interesting. And so therefore, we get this 
the symmetry is an element of the automorphisms of X tensor X. So the symmetry, so this is an element of pi one. So we've got a map from pi zero to pi one. And it turns out it factors through pi zero tensor Z two, which is a, a fact about symmetric modal, um, just about Picard groupoids. So um, pi zero, pi one, and K. It is a theorem of Huang Xuan uh, Sin that uh, these three pieces of algebraic data determine a Picard groupoid up to equivalence. Moreover, and I think this is also her theorem, although I'm not certain, this would be her PhD thesis, which is in French, uh, and she worked with Grotendieck. So homotopy classes of morphisms between Picard groupoids. So these are natural isomorphism classes of symmetric monoidal functors, or the things that we want to classify, you know, isomorphism classes of TFTs. These are naturally identified with data, a map on pi zero, a map on pi one, and condition commutes with the K invariant. So to prove the theorem, the classification of invertible field, topological field theories, we ought to determine pi zero, pi one, and K for the groupoid completion, the card groupoid completion of the Borden category, and for the invertible objects in aspect. Before I go on, let me check, are there other questions about this stuff? Okay. So let's start with this with a warm up case vector spaces. So you can do this directly. Pi zero. What is so in, invertible vector spaces up to isomorphism? Um, what do we have? We have we have just they're all isomorphic to C. So pi zero has is a is an abelian group with one element, and there's one of those. Now, what are the linear maps from C to itself that are invertible? That's C star. So this, this is related to what Saad asked earlier, which is uh, the, the category of invertible vector spaces you can think of as having a single object and a C star of morphisms. And as I mentioned, uh, Huang Xuan Sin determined that those are all, um, those are all, what's the word? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that determines it up to equivalence. So we could have used point and C star. And then the K invariant, well, there's only one map from zero to tensor Z2 to C star. Okay, Saad has a comment in chat about the relation to this and homotopy theory. So as you've noticed, I keep accidentally saying homotopy classes of maps when I should be saying, you know, isomorphism classes of functors, or sorry, natural isomorphism classes of functors. And, you know, the, the fact that I've said pi zero and pi one. So what's going on under the hood and what I'm going to say about right, a little bit about right at the end is that there, this stuff is tightly connected to homotopy theory of stuff. And this is one of the things that is nice about homotopy theory in its abstract, as opposed to just doing, you know, algebraic topology of spaces, that you get you get your hands on more abstract things, like like more general things, like categories or topological field theories that you didn't have tools to before. So um, th there there is a relationship here. Hopefully, it will if it is if it is murky now. Hopefully, it'll be clearer in like twenty minutes. Yeah, great comments, Saad. Um, okay, so for super vector spaces, and I'm going to leave this one as a little bit more of an exercise. Pi zero is z two, which is the even and odd line. Pi one is C star, which is again automorphisms of the even line, and the fact that the K invariant is non-trivial. There, there's unique non-trivial map Z two tensor Z two to C star. It's injective, and th that's the K invariant. So, if you like thinking about Picard groupoids or would like to understand the details of this proof a little better, this is a good thing to think about. Like, what's, why is it that K invariant? It's not, it's not too hard, and it's um, it'll help help your understanding of what, what's been happening. Now, for the Bordism category, by contrast, the, the uh, data for the groupoid completion is a major theorem. So there's a celebrated Galatius, Madsen, Tillman, Weiss paper, the homotopy type of the Bordism category. And um, what they do is they determine the homotopy type of the Bordism category. Okay, so they compute the, so there is a space that they obtain from the topological category of uh, Bordisms, and they compute its homotopy type. Uh, Nguyen goes a little further and extracts from that the Picard groupoid structure. So I want to, you know, people mostly mention GMTW, but Nguyen's paper is also important. So what do we get? This is not the, the way that they stated, but it is equivalent. Um, this formulation is due to Craig stoltz teichner in unpublished work. So pi zero is the ordinary Bordism. This one you can, um, this one I think you can do by hand, and the hard part is pi one. Pi one is, I'm going to say what it is, it's something called the SKK Bordism group. Uh, GMTW said it differently but it is in fact equivalent to what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say. And um, the K invariant, 
Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but but here's the idea. So S1 has a framing, which is or has two framings up to equivalence. One is induced as the as the boundary of the, the trivial framing on the disk, you know, because it sits inside R2. And one of them is the lead group framing, the non-bounded framing on S1, where you you know how to move a tangent vector around S1. Like like sort of the um unit tangent. Because S1 is R1 mod mod Z. So what that does is that that is a thing that takes a manifold and gives a manifold in one dimension higher. And what the, the, the fact is that this sends a this this is well defined from borders and classes to SKK borders and classes. And so it gives you a K invariant. So I had to say a Xi structure, but it turns out a framing induces a Xi structure because a framing is a trivialization of the tangent bundle. So it, a null homotopy of the map to BO. And then you, you know, that in therefore. You know, there's a canonical choice for how to lift a null homotopy you know, to to the constant map upstairs to the base point. So, S1 with that size structure, even though there may be others, is giving you the K invariant. Um, any questions about this before I go on? All right. So now we need to prove the theorem. We've what we've seen is so invertible TFTs valued in S vector are classified by maps, maps of Picard groupoids from the groupoid completion of the borders and category to S vect C star. And that by, uh, is identified with pairs of maps, F0 from the, board, you know, the, board is, the original bordism group to Z2, and F1 from the SKK bordism group to C star. And they must, they must commute the K invariant. So crucially, the K invariant for super vector spaces is injected, and therefore, F1 uniquely determines F0 if F0 can exist. So the question is, is there a problem? So for example, you could have a, um, an F1 for which no possible F0 exists. But the K invariant tensors with Z2. So the image of, let's say I take the K invariant borders and categories, and then map to, and then evaluate. So mapping to C star. That is contained in Z2. And um, so, you know, commutativity says that that pulls back to the uh, to pi zero of S vect, which is Z mod two. And therefore, we can um, we can always choose an F zero by, by, by just saying, OK, well, you know, we map we map an object to the Z two down there. Shades it across the diagonal. And so therefore, we can lose the data F zero. F1 determines F0, which is which exists and is unique. And that's what tells us that these um that uh, invertible TFTs valued in S vect are are identified with maps from this SKK group to C star. So now I promised to tell you what um S, what the SKK group is. So why don't I actually do that? So we're gonna do a different notion of boards. And what that what that notion of boredism is, is the notion where um, bounding means something slightly stronger. Well, actually, considerably stronger. M bounds W, not just what I meant, but also that the outward normal vector field on M extends to a non-vanishing vector field on W. So this is this is quite a bit stronger. And so strong, in fact, it only defines a commutative monoid under this choice. And so we have to group complete it, like I told you. To obtain what's called the SKK group. So SKK was uh, th this, this group was first studied by uh, by Karas, Kreck, Neumann, and Osa, who are German. So they called it uh, Schneiden, Clayton, and Control, uh, cutting and pasting, which and controlled. So they defined it in a different way, but they said, okay, we allow these cutting operations and pasting operations, but we control it with this other data. So you can you can look it up in their in their uh, monograph. Though it was originally done, uh, studied by Janich under a different name. It's also been studied in equivalent formats by Reinhardt and Madsen Tilden. So um, what, what I've just called the you know, SKK boardism group or SKK boardism has many other names. Vector field boardism under Reinhardt. Reinhardt boardism, which is uh, you know, since he thought about it, uh, Dan Fried prefers this, this name, Reinhardt boardism. Uh, Madsen Tilden boardism and Lorentz boardism for, for some of the more, pe when people thought about this in general relativity because it's related to the notion of Lorentz metric. Possibly more. Anyways, this so we we obtain the SKK group and an SKK boredism invariant is a map from that to C star. Uh, let me pause for questions. Um, this isn't exactly a, a question, 
Uh, I've been trying to think of um, an example of this, um, a, a vortism which is not a uh, vector field vortism. And I can't really uh, at least mentally come up with one. Are you able to draw a cartoon? Or uh, give let me example? think about, let me think of an example. There's, There's gotta be, um, I mean, I know there are lots of them because these, you know, where there are calculations of SKK groups, there's very different things. Um, let's see. How about S2? So S2 bounds a disk, right? Right. But the out, or, or sorry, not a disk, a ball. But it turns out that the outward normal vector field does not extend. Like it's it it will have to have a singularity somewhere inside right. the inside the ball. Okay. So that that is an example. And in fact, you know, S two generates as the sum end of the oriented two dimensional SKK group. So okay. that's that's a good example. Uh, maybe I'll segue because that's related to the uh, notions of Bordism invariance. In particular, the Euler characteristic is an SKK invariant. So. The fact that that chi of S2 is non-zero detects this. So what's going on here? So the Euler characteristic of the bulk manifold, because, because we have a non-vanishing vector field on the whole thing, bulk plus boundary, the Euler characteristic on the, on the total thing vanishes by the poincare hop theorem. And now pick CW structures and use the gluing form. So we, we've counted the cells on the interior, and we've counted the cells on the, uh, on the boundary, and the... Um, And they both like the the, the Euler characteristic of the, the purely the interior must vanish, and therefore the Euler, char Euler characteristic of the boundary must vanish. So the Euler characteristic is an SKK invariant. This is very much not true for uh, or, for ordinary bordism, where you know S two bounds a ball. Um, another good example of an ordinary of SKK invariants or ordinary bordism invariants, because SKK bordism is stricter than ordinary bordism. And another interesting one for oriented SKK bordism is the Kerver semi-characteristic, kappa, which is where we sum the Betty numbers mod two. Um, and this is in dimension uh, 4K plus one. So that's about it. There may be other ones, but this is like, there's not that much more. They tend to be one of these three. Uh, let me check that there are, there, are there any more questions right now? Okay. I'm, I'm going to try and finish a little bit early so that I have time for questions before there, there's a talk I'd like to go to that starts like at 11 plus epsilon. And so I'd like to, um, I, I, I'm going to try and finish by 1055 so that I have time for everyone's questions. Okay. So I'd like to concretely say many examples of ordinary borders variance. And so what, what you can do is let's say that a Xi structure gives you canonical access to some cohomology class. So for example, you know, characteristic classes of the tangent bundle, or if you have a map to a space X, you can pull back cohomology classes of X. And let's say you do that to get up to dimension N so that you can integrate and get something non-zero. And when I say cohomology, I mean something super general. You could use generalized cohomology, you know, K-theory, Bordism, whatever, you, TMF. You could use twisted cohomology as long as you have an integration with Xi structure. So let's say you want a Bordism invariant of oriented six manifolds with principal U1 bundles. One thing you could do is take the first Pontryagin class P1, which lives in H4, and you take the first churn class of the principal bundle, which lives in H2, Multiply them together, get, get something in H4 plus two, that's six, and then integrate and you get a number. This number is, is not just an integer, it is a Bordism invariant. And this is, well, one reason is churn Vathian, which says that both P1 and C1 admit Durham models as closed forms, closed differential forms, and then Stokes theorem does it for them. If you, um, I'll leave you to think about the details there that like, you know, it's just a couple lines. But you, sometimes things are not given by churn Bay theory. Like I mentioned, generalized cohomology, twisted cohomology, twisted generalized cohomology. And in general, there's an argument in Milner Stashev. They say it for Stiefel Whitney classes, but their argument generalizes. So this formula, you know, I just gave P1C1, but there's many, 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 many examples, and they they all follow this line of reasoning. So I'm going to quickly finish by saying, um, oh yeah, right. So so this gives you. Let me say the examples of, of um, invertible field theories. The Euler characteristic gives us, you know, well, that gives us a z-valued invariant. So let's take lambda to the Euler characteristic. And that gives us the Euler TFT that I talked about last time. 
But there's also these new things given by ordinary Bordesman variants. And so those categorify to these invertible TFTs. Defining them is tricky because um, a lot of a lot of implicit choices and contractual choices went into the went into this classification theorem. And so if you wanted to if you want to define this on um, manifolds with boundary, you're going to have to do something messy. So Fried Quinn does something similar where like they, they give examples where the Bordesman variant is a characteristic class of, the, of a principal G bundle with G of finite groups. So I'll point you there and then, or maybe Kazuya Yonakura also has a paper which does this and it's kind of complicated, but um, like there, there's choices and it's a little bit messy, but you can do it. And then there is a Kerber theory I won't say much more about. Now let me quickly finish by saying that there's homotopy theory going on in the background. So what they do is they, they use stable homotopy theory. So given a Picard groupoid, you can take the nerve, which is a um, simplicial set, simplicial abelian group, in fact, and then take the geometric realization. And this gives you a pointed CW complex whose homo higher homotopy groups vanish. So because you started with a Picard groupoid, this is something called a group-like E infinity space. E infinity comes from the fact we started with a symmetric monodal structure. Picard gives us group-like. And therefore, by some infinite loop space theory, you get a spectrum in the sense of homotopy theory, like Rock talked about last week, whose homotopy groups vanish away from degrees zero and one. And this is called the classifying spectrum of your Picard groupoid. So now pi zero, pi one, and k come from the Postnikov theory of this. But I figured it was easier to say it directly than to invoke two large machines. There is a, there is a one dimensional stable homotopy hypothesis. So this is related to the original homotopy hypothesis relating infinity categories, or sorry, infinity groupoids and spaces. This is a struct, you know, the abelian groups version, hence stable, which, and then we're truncating, hence one dimensional. So this is closely related to Saad's comment down there. So the one dimensional stable homotopy hypothesis conjectures that this process, to, you know, obtaining a spectrum with just two homotopy groups from a Picard groupoid defines an equivalence of homotopy theories. So there's different ways of making that precise, but we pick one of them and it should be from the category of Picard groupoids to the category of spectra and with only pi zero and pi one non-trivial. So you might say one truncated connective spectra. So this one dimensional stable homotopy hypothesis was a folk theorem proven by many different people. Johnson and Osorno is the place where I read about it. And so I recommend their paper. Um, then Postnikov theory tells you how to determine homotopy classes of maps between these things. Again, this was, a, I think, a folklore theorem, but, again, but you know, Johnson and uh, Niles Johnson and Angelica Osorno have some, you know, tell, tell you exactly what to do. And what Galatius, Matson, Tillman, and Weiss did was identify the classifying space of the group by completion of board. And what Nguyen did was determine the group like infinity structure, hence the classifying spectrum. And their arguments use home, like are stated in a very homotopical way. Oops, oh, this is way too much on a slide, sorry. So a certain subset of you are thinking, why drag in all of this homotopy theory? This is so much for just a thing about like the card group weights, which are not so scary. And we're often interested in classifying what are called extended topological field theories. And so these are formulated in terms of higher categories. So boredism in N or even infinity N categories and a target infinity N categories, maybe like the two category of categories and N category of EN minus one algebras or something. And so the, the hands-on approach I said, where there's like the card group voids and whatnot. Well, the homotopical approach generalizes much better to making these computations. You know, you sort of have the room to wheel stuff around. So invertible extended TFTs are classified between maps called like the card N groupoids. So we've categorified N minus one more times. And there is an N dimensional stable homotopy hypothesis. You can take the nerve of a Picard N groupoid and then geometrically realize and you obtain a space. And then um, that it turns out to have a group like the infinity structure again. So you get a spectrum. And so the, this, this uh, categorified stable homotopy hypothesis says that you get an equivalence between the homotopy theory of Picard N groupoids and that of spectra whose homotopy groups are concentrated Ah, shoot, this should be zero to n, right? Like we did pi zero and pi one. So this was a uh, conjecture for a while, but it is recent as of last year, a theorem of Moser, Osonor uh, Osonorva, uh, Pauli, Sarasola, Verdugo. So good theorem, good paper, highly recommend. Well, okay, I haven't read the paper in super great detail, but it, you know what I've read, I like. Chris Scholarpreis computes the homotopy type of the Bordism n category you know, gets out a classifying spectrum. And the upshot is that depending on your choice of target, invertible extended TFTs are again classified in terms of S SKK groups, to, or maybe in terms of cohomology groups of, um, of, of something 
homotopy or cohomology groups of things called Madsen-Tillman spectra. And then, you know, you get SKK groups as a special case of that. Um, so just a little peek behind the curtain as to what, you know, what was really happening in the proof of this theorem. But if you only care about non-extended TFTs, which is a good place to start, then you can, you can break, break it down into simpler components. So that's all for today. Reminder, I'll be hanging around in the same Zoom room for office hours starting at around three. Um, so let's, you know, please, please ask me questions. You know, some now, and if you want to talk later, there's Slack, there's office hours, but questions. And thank you for coming. Where in uh, Milner Stashev is this, um, this theorem, I guess, that you can represent uh, the Pontryagin class and the uh, Turing class? I think it was Woods, uh, right. as differential forms. That is not Milner Stashev. This is a uh, Chern Vey theory. Or oh, so I see, I see. their appendix C, I think, discusses this briefly, but I don't mm -hmm. actually know what the right reference for Chern Vey theory is because. Um, so you're thinking like with like real coefficients here, basically? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you, it turns out you can lift the story to differential cohomology, but that's a story for another day. Yeah, I heard you're working on that with uh, uh, some other people. How's that going? I'm, I shouldn't. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's an old later. theorem <laughs> that you can do that. that. This is just we're writing up some notes about it. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I'd be happy to tell you more about that at some point. Maybe, maybe later today, since uh, since that's a little bit unrelated. But it is. Well, okay, you can you can relate it to invertible non-topological field theories. But yeah, I'll we, we can talk about that at some point. Uh, more more questions. Okay, if there, if there aren't more questions yet. So Matt, just to say a little more, there's this, so from the beginning it was known, so differential cohomology is this thing that is a, it is a geometrical analog of ordinary cohomology. So like if, if um, vector bundles have determined characteristic classes in ordinary cohomology, vector bundles with connection determine characteristic classes in differential cohomology and there's like analogies. So the original paper introducing differential cohomology by uh, Cheeger and Simons, um, pointed out that so they did a bunch of applications and one of the applications is that you can lift the churn bay map which takes an invariant polynomial on the lie algebra to a durham class a closed form so they can they lift this to it to differential cohomology so one so it's uh this is uh bonka nikolaus and vocal that do this in sort of a modern framework which uh, makes for a, a slightly slicker proof and it's just honestly i think it's kind of neat it doesn't help you with this. Uh, if you're thinking about invertible topological field theories, it doesn't really help you a lot because you know you're, everything factors through ordinary cohomology. For non-topological invertible field theories, what we don't quite know what those are yet, but conjecturally, you should be able to use differential cohomology uh, characteristic classes to, to obtain examples of these because you know you know, get this geometric structure on your borders. And so what Matt mentioned is. Um, so we had a seminar on this a couple of years ago, uh, joint between UT and um, MIT and Harvard, which was uh, basically the Mike Hopkins students and the Dan Fried students and their friends who were uh, also interested. And so we, you know, someone gave a talk on this and a bunch of other stuff. And so a couple of us are trying to tidy that up those lecture notes to something readable that that might be useful for people to learn about. And hopefully we'll have that up on archive in a couple months, which is famous last words. So yeah, I don't know much about that story. I just know that you know, there's this this names Cheeger, Simons, yep. and um, I think Simons and Sullivan also wrote something. Is that right? Simons and Sullivan have a paper on. So there's many different models for differential K theory, and Simon mm -hmm. Sullivan is one of them. Um, I, I, think, okay. I have not read that paper beyond the introduction, but it looked it looked good. There's a paper. Um, you know, this is just things I've seen. You know, you know, big banner. If I could put it up on the Zoom screen, things I've seen on the archive. Um, Oscar Randall Williams uploaded something with uh, different physics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of, do you, you know anything about that? Like, I just, I saw it and I was like, oh, that's curious. I should. Like, <laughs> Let's, um, so I've got to run soon, but yeah. do, are, are you going to be around for like in the afternoon again? I don't think so because I meet with my okay. advisor at 3 35. Okay. Uh, then, yeah, you, you should do that. And um, so can you send me a message on Slack or Twitter or somewhere? Yeah, I, need to, and I need to get onto the Slack. 
Um, oh shoot! If you if you don't know how, um, it should be on the web page, right? Yes. Okay. okay. If you encounter any problems, so for anyone, you know, if you're encountering problems with Slack, you know, if you if you want to talk to someone about technical issues or something, I am that person or one of the four people. Please get in touch with me, and we'll we'll get you in. But um, I mean, Matt, you know how to you know how to how to contact me. So let's um let let's let's find a time where I can tell you more about it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, great. Okay, any final questions before before uh, either tomorrow or this afternoon or whatever? Please ask if you have questions. All right. Well, thank thanks for coming. I'll see you either later today or tomorrow. I'm going to um, pause the recording.